Sweet breads derived from the 16th century. The thymus or pancreas, usually taken from a calf or lamb, sometimes procured from the ovary or testicles. First, it's soaked in cold water to remove all traces of blood, then poached in milk until tender. As a kid, my father told me it had been a holiday tradition that dated back generations in his side of the family. I would later find out just how far back that was when I turned 16, when I learned the true history of the Gunnarsson family holiday tradition. You see, our families have continually been amongst the upper echelon of society for over a millennia. As leaders, politicians, tycoons, icons, you name it. Every member of every family knew nothing but success and happiness from birth up until their last dying breaths. And the sweet breads, my parents told me, were the key to all of our success. You see, centuries ago, our ancestors were on the brink of destruction. They had no food, no resources, no home. They had nothing left. And so they prayed to anything that would grant them release, their deepest desires. They prayed long and hard. Something finally answered. And they made a deal. They were given a choice, an annual tradition that must be kept. And so long as it was, the family and all of their descendants would never know a day of sorrow again. My father told me that he had learned the same age I did, and so had my brothers, and eventually my baby sister would as well. That year on Christmas Eve, after dinner, my parents dismissed my brothers from the table, telling them to prepare. Prepare for what I didn't know. After they left, my parents told me the complete history of the Gunnarsson holiday tradition. And after they finished, my father said it was time for me to join my brothers, my mother, and himself in the tradition. I would only have to watch this year, he said. But next year, I would have to do it all, alone. My brothers returned, and my parents rose, beckoning me to follow them. I did as I was told, following my family through the back doors, out into the cold December night, and down the path to our garage. Our family compound was located some ways outside the small town that my father was mayor of, with an isolated patch of dense forest. I had always complained as a kid that my friends could never visit, that we were never allowed to give out our address. Now I know why. I entered the garage behind my family and saw that half the space had been blocked off by a white sheet. The overhead lights were off, with only the glow of a dozen candles providing any illumination. My mother, who had been a highly respected specialist within the medical field, wheeled out a metal cart. On top lay a collection of surgical knives, masks, and gloves. She passed out gloves and masks for everyone, and once we had them on, my father finally pulled back the curtain. There was a woman, someone I'd never seen before, strapped to the table. She looked to be sleeping. I could see her bare chest moving up and down slowly. My father wordlessly picked up the longest of the knives off the table and handed it to my eldest brother. My brother just took it and stepped up to the woman. I looked back and studied her. She looked to be around my mother's age, with long flowing strawberry blonde hair that was placed directly on top of her breasts, maybe in some vain attempt to retain her dignity. An IV drip ran from her arm to her pole next to the table, which I assumed was some sort of drug that was keeping her unconscious. I looked at the woman and then at the knife my brother was holding and then back at my father. This entire time, nobody had uttered a word. The air was stifled with an uncomfortable silence. When my father finally spoke up, he said only one word. 
began. And then I remembered the sweetbreads. I almost threw up my entire dinner right then and there. I had never seen a knife cut through human flesh before. My head began to swirl, and I wanted to look away, but I knew I couldn't. It's like watching the flaming wreckage of a car accident on the side of the road. I didn't want to see, but I couldn't look away. So I stood in silence as brother collected our sweetbreads. After it was done, my family began filing out of the garage one at a time. I stood, frozen in place, looking at the white curtain that my father had thankfully pulled back. Mother was the last to leave. She did her best to console me, telling me it had been hard for her to adjust in the beginning, but that this one sacrifice was well worth the treasures that it brought. I just looked at her, dumbfounded and unsure of what to say. But then what? I asked numbly. What do you mean? She inquired back. What happens to us afterwards? After all of this is over? I asked, already knowing the answer of my deepest heart of hearts. My mother had taken a back thought for a moment, then smiled. And we joined the rest of the family. Ruling together forever. She said with an icy chill that clung to her very words. Together forever. Somewhere deep inside of me knew from the very beginning. The never-ending flow of cash, the isolated mansion, our status within town. I had gotten every single thing I had ever wanted my entire life. And this had been the cost. Only one day a year. Just one, my mother said. I followed her back inside, masking my shame in a cloud of indifference. Everything had changed. The way I viewed the world, my family, our name, my life, even my very soul. I didn't sleep a wink that night. I tried, but every time I would close my eyes, I saw the woman, still strapped on the table, in the blood, and then the sweetbreads. Father warned me once the tradition had started, if it was not kept, punishment would be swift and severe. He reminded me of an older cousin who had passed away very suddenly of leukemia a few years back, right after he turned 17. Leukemia. He suffered every single day until he died, according to my father. And the same would happen to me if I didn't continue the tradition. The next morning, my family woke as usual and gathered downstairs. We exchanged presents, jokes, laughter. Everyone acted as if everything were normal. I put on a convincing show. I laughed back, opened my gifts, smiled for all the photos. I pulled it off, masterfully so, I should say. They never suspected. They never knew what was boiling right under the surface. Not even when it came time for the sweetbreads. I choked back my tears and urged to vomit. Though as hard as it was, I almost gave in. I kept my smile wide and my eyes open. After our plates were cleared, my father stood up and toasted to his family and our success and hoped for many more generations to come. And for the day to come when his first daughter would join the rest of the family in the annual tradition. Father then looked at me proudly, not a worry in his eye. As far as he knew, I had been another successful convert. I can say confidently, without any hint of exaggeration, that I dreaded each and every single one of the next 364 days. I finally started sleeping again after three, only for my sleep to be continually interrupted by the woman on the table, who would wake up suddenly and begin screaming my name every time I cut into her neck. I would go days, one time even a week without sleep. I'd lie awake in bed, pondering over how I was going to do it. Could I even do it? Was there a way out? There had to be a way out. Mother and father told me in private a couple of days after Christmas that I could pick anyone I wanted to use to carry on the tradition. Could even be a complete stranger. All I had to do was give them a name and they would take care of the rest. 
but they warned me if I didn't pick someone myself, that they would do it for me. And they promised me that it would be someone that I would miss dearly. My skin ran cold at the thought of someone, a friend, a teacher, a random stranger, tied up to that table, knife in my hand, their internal organs on our dining room table. I knew there was no way out. I kept my facade up, pretending the long, sleepless nights away as caffeine-fueled study sessions formulated my plan. I would have to pick someone who trusted me, someone I could get alone, someone who could disappear. There was a friend, a dear friend. Once upon a time, she had been a distant neighbor. But even after my family moved, she remained my closest friend and one true confidant. She would trust me. She would do anything for me. I loved her, and now she would disappear for me. Christmas Eve. It finally came, like any other important day that you wait or dread for. Suddenly one day it's tomorrow. My parents had kept their end of the bargain. They expressed no surprise, no remorse. They simply nodded their heads and told me it would be taken care of. But the rest would be up to me. That evening, as I was walking down the hall to join my family in the dining room, I passed my baby sister's room. She had not even been a year old last Christmas, too young to partake in the tradition, but not this year. I pushed the thought from my head and continued downstairs. The family was busy chatting around the table as I sat in my seat. Mother had prepared a lovely dinner of homemade mashed potatoes, turkey with gravy, roasted peanuts, and an orange cream cake, my absolute favorite. The sweetbreads wouldn't be until tomorrow, of course. Mother placed a fully loaded plate in front of me. On any other Christmas Eve, my mouth would have already been stuffed full of potatoes. This Christmas Eve, I was resisting another powerful urge to vomit all over the table. But I kept my cool, as I had done the past 364 days. Only one more left. I grabbed my fork as my father concluded his annual prayer of thanks and reluctantly began forcing the food into my mouth. Just eating in front of them had become a chore, an act I was eager to finally drop. Everything tasted like paper, wet, moist, without any real flavor. I must have lost 15 pounds since last Christmas, but no one seemed to notice. They were all too far gone. Once dinner was over, my brothers went off to do whatever it is that they do, while my mother began clearing the table. Nobody said anything at first, until I did. Is she ready? I asked plainly. My parents both looked at me, slightly puzzled. Probably not what they were expecting. I then looked directly at my mother. She had stopped clearing the table and was now hovering behind my father. She caught my gaze and for a moment looked almost scared. Then a nasty smirk began spreading across her face. Yes, she is, baby. And it serves her right for breaking my sweet little boy's heart. Don't you worry about a thing, sweetie. No one is even going to know she's gone. We make sure of that. She bragged, now turning her attention back to the table. Father looked at me, still puzzled, not sure what to make of my newfound bravado. I just hoped it was working. He smirked, the same way my mother had, and I knew then I had him hook, line, and sink her. Don't be too rough on the meat, son. We like it nice and plump, remember? My father spoke, sending waves of nausea back down into my stomach. I held back, thankfully, and got up from the table. I won't take too long. Santa's coming early this year, I said, and left without a word. Father chuckled briefly, but I caught my mother's shocked reflection on the glass doors on my way out. Too much, perhaps. <laughs> Whatever. The walk to the garage was probably the longest walk of my life. My entire life swirled around in my head, all array of emotions, everything that had led to this moment. The moment I would carry on the Gunnarsson holiday tradition. I counted each step I took as I slowly made my way to the garage. The lights were off and there was no noise. She must be heavily sedated. 
The single side door was already open, and the familiar glow of candlelight cast long shadows around me. I turned on a set of lights, unimpressed and annoyed with my parents' theatrics at this point. That's when I saw the same white curtain as before, with the same set of knives on the same table. My heart skipped a beat. I needed to leave. Abort the mission, find another way. No. There was no other way. It was now or never. I took one last breath and remembered what my father had told me. The pact that our family had made, a deal forged in blood all those years ago. Without hesitation, I walked towards the curtains, and with one swift motion, drew them back. There she lay, fully clothed as I had requested. I would not allow this to be the first time I saw her naked. Sure enough, though, a long needle pierced her skin and ran up an identical IV pole. The bat looked to be practically empty. I looked to the clock on the wall. I would only have a few precious minutes left. I turned to the instruments of death next to me. The low light from the candles accented the chilly sting in the air. I picked up a knife randomly and swung back around to take one last look at the girl. But then I froze. My gaze had met an opening pair of eyes. She was struggling to regain consciousness, but she was definitely awake. As her eyes widened and focused on me, she didn't look scared or confused. She just looked at me, face blank and mouth agape. The knife in my hand felt like solid gold. Everything had finally come together. Now it was my turn. For the first night in over a year, I slept like a stone. No nightly terrors, no ghostly visions of the woman from the table. No macabre family celebrations. Just a deep, soundless sleep. I was almost sad when I woke up. It had felt so good. Hopefully the first of many nights to come. Besides, today was a very special day. It was Christmas after all. More importantly, the day of our blessed family tradition. The sweetbreads that had been prepared by myself. As was tradition, I could smell them from even upstairs. Just moments later, Father came in, wishing me a Merry Christmas and inviting me to join the family downstairs. It was time. I slipped on my house coat and slippers and walked downstairs and into the kitchen, back arched and head held high with confidence I hadn't known in some time. Mother, ever the watchful hawk, took notice immediately. Well, don't you look as bright as the morning sunrise. <laughs> Merry Christmas, baby. She nearly squealed as she put the finishing touches on her immaculate table. I smirked as I sat down next to my brothers, then noticed my baby sister was missing. Where's Sissy? I asked, genuinely concerned for her well-being at this point, knowing full well what this family was capable of. Oh, she's just got a fever right now. We'll have to save some for her later, my mother responded. Oh. How perfect. I remained quiet as mother finished the sweetbreads and brought them over to the table. One by one, she placed a fine scoop on a small, delicate plate in front of each of us. The plates had been in the family for decades and were used only for one purpose. After mother joined us at the table, father rose once more. I don't know why father insisted on making the same speech every single year. It was cringe on so many levels, even now more so than ever, though I held my tongue as he spoke. When I look at this table, I see the pillar of success. Our family, our blood, our sacrifice, our family tradition has kept our family strong and alive, and we continue that legacy now and forever. And I am so proud to welcome my third son into the tradition. Son, you've made me, our family, and our ancestors incredibly proud. His words made my stomach churn. His father sat back in his seat, almost on instinct. The family joined hands. Mother and brother on either side of me. Closing our eyes, my parents led us in a prayer. Lord, bless us, these sweet breaths, as you have blessed our family. Rain riches, treasures, and power upon us, as you have done so for generations. Ascend us above all others as we carry on this most sacred of tradition. 
today, tomorrow, and forever. My brothers, always too eager for their own good, dropped their hands first and immediately began eating. I watched as my parents smiled in admiration, then turned their attention to their own plates. Father was the first of them to take a bite. He smiled at first, but then I watched as his expression changed quickly. He was puzzled. He stopped chewing for a moment before swallowing. He hesitated and took another bite. I looked at my mother, who had also started eating, but as she went in for a second bite, her nose wrinkled and she stopped. She began looking around, now confused like my father. What's the matter, father? Don't they taste good? I asked bluntly. My father looked at me, now more confused than ever. Of course, there's just something off, he said sheepishly, though I could hear the fear growing inside of him. I had felt that same fear for the past 365 days. Do you guys smell that? My mother asked, worry now thick in her voice. I looked back at my brothers who had already finished their entire plates, my eldest even licking the plate clean with his tongue. My other brother had noticed the exchange between our parents and I and spoke up. Smell what? I don't smell anything. Yeah, I don't smell anything either, I said dishonestly. My father, though, had also denied smelling anything out of the ordinary. So, it was just my mother and I. How can you guys not smell that? It smells almost like something's burning. Or, she trailed off. Or what, mother? Perhaps something bitter? I said as I stared directly into her eyes. In that moment, I saw a flash of clarity across her face. Then I watched as all the color drained completely away from every part of her body. What have you done? My mother sputtered out. What the hell is going on? My father screamed. But before anyone could answer, he was interrupted by an agonizing scream. My eldest brother had been the first. He fell to the floor howling like a wounded lion. I looked down to see his eyes turning blood red. His central nervous system was starting to shut down, and bloody vomit with saliva was now pouring out of his mouth. My other brother sat frozen, staring as our sibling died in front of us, mother screaming incoherently in the background. Father had stood up to get a better look, but was knocked back into his chair almost immediately, bringing one of his hands to his head. I had thought father would be next, but only a second later my other brother bent over in agony and began throwing up as well. What did you do to us? My mother shrieked as her second child died finally in front of her, still too shocked to move from her seat. Father was now fading fast. His face was covered in sweat, his gaze now locked into mine. I stared into his eyes, trying with all my might to bore the hatred and fear I had felt this entire year into his soul. You make me sick, every single one of you, I spat out now finally free to unleash the wrath that had been building up for so long. Did you really think that I was going to carry on this tradition? Do you know how sick to my stomach I've been every day this past year? Our family, our tradition, it's an abomination. And when I thought of spending every single Christmas side by side with you, sealed in this deal for all eternity, I wanted to strap myself onto that table. This was pure bliss. The best part is that they would know in their last moments that it had been me that killed them. So I made a deal of my own. They had made it too easy for me, really. I had almost everything I needed, thanks to Mother. The only thing missing was a decoy. Him being a gunnerson meant that I could get my hands on practically anything in this town. Father collapsed out of his chair, and I could feel the convulsions through the table and floor as he breathed his last painful breaths. Mother was the last to succumb. She grasped her chest, heaving in pain. I could hear the blood clotting with every gasp of air she took. She got up to reach for me, but fell to the floor as I stood up and hovered beside her. Kneeling down, my face now inches from hers, I searched for any trace of the mother I used to know. But there was nothing, because the mother I knew had been a lie. Was it worth it, mother? I whispered to her. Tears filled her bloodshot eyes as she let out one final death rattle. 
and then all was silent. I paused, unsure of what to do next. I stood up straight to survey the carnage around me, then looked back at the table and saw my mother's untouched glass of wine. Without hesitation, I grabbed it and held it up high. Toast to the Gunnarsson family tradition, I boasted, drinking the entire glass in a single gulp. Setting the glass down, I spoke aloud. You can come in now, my voice echoing off the vaulted ceilings. Seconds later, I caught movement to the right, but I didn't take my gaze off the floor. She had played her part perfectly. She didn't believe me at first, not when I offered to pay her $10,000 to play victim. She thought it was a joke. I'm sure she got quite the scare, though, when my mother abducted her. That it would be worth it, I told her. That this small amount would be but a fraction of what she and I would have once the tradition was over. So she agreed. And thankfully she had awoken last night when she did. She had proven to be invaluable. Whoa, that was fast, she said in awe, studying the scene before her. Yeah, well, we put enough in there to kill a whole football team, I retorted, still locked into a death stare with my mother. Her eyes were pointed upwards, an expression of horror and pain now permanently etched into her face. Is everything ready? I questioned as I turned to face her for the first time. Yes, it's all out in the garage, she replied as she walked up to me. My hands ran across her face and then through her auburn curly hair. Go bring it in. We don't have a lot of time and there's a lot to do. I told her, leaning in for a kiss. Her mouth was wet and her lips were plump. Finally, it was beginning to feel like Christmas. She left without another word, leaving me alone in the kitchen once again. We had sanitized the room, then buried the bodies in the woods, and a six-foot grave alongside the cadaver I procured from the local university. It would take all night, but after it was done, they would never be found. Only business left would be my little sister. I turned on my heel and began walking into the living room. As I started to go upstairs to tend to Sissy, something caught my attention. Something on our Christmas tree. My parents were never one to go overboard with Christmas decorations, seeing them as a waste of time and money. Our Christmas trees, therefore, had consisted of a golden garland and classic silver glass ball ornaments. Nothing more, nothing less. Except now there was something else. Nestled almost perfectly within the tree was a dark red envelope. It had not been there last night, nor this morning. My curiosity piked, I walked over and grabbed the card out of the tree. It wasn't sealed, and when I opened it, an identically colored card slid out. I ran my fingers over the card and envelope, looking for an inscription, barcode, something to identify where the card came from. Nothing. Cautiously, I opened the card. There was no signature, no seasonal greeting, nothing but a single phrase. Sweets to the sweet. Almost instantly, my back ran cold. I could feel the little hairs on my legs beginning to stand up one by one. From some dark corner of the house, I could feel something stirring. And then, I felt it. Just a single, cold breath down my neck. I could feel my heart flutter. I counted to three in my head, then jerked around. But there was nothing. In an instant, the house settled and everything was as I had been before. I looked back to the card, but now it had vanished. I searched around me but could find no evidence that it had ever even been there. A cry from upstairs brought me back to reality. My baby sister. Mother had said she was running a fever. Fear in the worst, I darted upstairs and down the hall to my sister's nursery. My mother fancied herself an interior designer and insisted on the gaudiest Victorian era nursery for my sister. My sister's crib had been adorned with sheets of silk and sheer fabric. I pulled them away and looked down at my beautiful baby sister, I smiled at her, and she seemed to smile back. She would never know the horror of the family tradition. I would miss her dearly, but I knew she would be better off with another family, somewhere out of state, far away from our family's legacy of death and decay. Her rosy cheeks felt warm under my finger as they moved across her face. A weird sensation came over me. It was a feeling I couldn't quite figure out at first. I looked at her, puzzled. Then my eyes ran over her throat. Soon my mouth began to water. 
pools of saliva now collecting inside. Then I knew. I felt. Hungry. Sweets to the sweet. Thank you again for listening to this story. I hope you enjoyed it. From Lone Wolf Media, I wish you all a very merry holiday. Stay safe out there. Be kind. And I'll see you all soon.